Charlie Mock in Germany interviews with men who seized the first bridge over the Rhine intact. Ray Morgan was taken early in March by a task force of the 9th Armored Division. Lieutenant Colonel Leonard Engerman, commander of the task force, describes his first view of the undamaged Ray Morgan bridge. On uh, March the 7th, at about noon, with Lieutenant Grimble as my advance guard commander, my column uh, came to the hill there, which commands a view of this whole valley. I formulated a plan to uh, come into the town and reach the approach to the bridge. Movement began uh, when the head of the column got to the end of the bridge on the other side. The tanks immediately took position and began firing across the bridge to the approaches on this side uh, at the Germans who were on the bridge. Uh, the infantry then started moving across. It was about 3.30 at that time. I received a message about that time that the bridge would be blown at 4 o'clock. In a few minutes, two detonations occurred on the bridge. Uh, looking at the bridge, I could see that the, inf the infantry was still moving over and that the bridge was still in one piece and it would be available for foot troops to move over. And that's all there was to it. Now, I'd like to have uh, Lieutenant Grimble tell his story. We went right on down to the bridge the bridge was manned by German engineers in the towers. There were lots of snipers and some machine guns. The tanks covered the towers and fired on them. The Germans jumped from the tops of the towers to the bridge. They ran back across the bridge and our infantry pursued them. Under covering fire from tanks on the west bank, an infantry patrol was sent to set up a skirmish line east of the Rhine. First to cross the span were Sergeant Drabik and PFC Jensen. Sergeant Drabik is questioned by the photographer. Oh, was it pretty hot coming over? It was plenty hot when we was coming over. That bridge seemed very long. It looked like, they tell me it's only 250 yards, it looked like miles long. Along with the infantry, a detail of engineers went onto the bridge. Sergeants Dorland and Reynolds and Lieutenant Mott, who describes the assignment. After the infantry had taken the town of Remagen, the task force commander, Lieutenant Colonel Engelman, called me up and ordered me out on the bridge to do some reconnaissance. I was to find out what demolitions were on the bridge and if the bridge would take traffic, and if not, how long it would take to repair the bridge for traffic. I'd like for Sergeant Dawson to relate to you just what happened when he found the switch box and the electro electrical cable. On entering the bridge, searching for demolitions and finding that the first few charges we came to were wired electrically into a main electrical conduct running the length of the bridge. I immediately went to the far side of the bridge and beyond the last charge that was on the bridge, severed the main electric cable by rifle fire. I then located the master switch at the far end of the bridge and kind of crossed my fingers and threw it out. Nothing happened then. There was no booby trap of any kind. After disposing of the master switch on the east bank, the engineers worked their way back, neutralizing the unexploded charges. Sergeant Reynolds explains. Sergeant Dolan, Dolan blew the couple cables in two and threw the switch box. Started working back this way and we found one main charge about 500 pounds, it hadn't been detonated. We neutralized that and worked on this way. We came to the pier. The pier had two big separate wells in it, filled with explosives. We cut the wires to that because they were too heavy to lift out. And we just kept working back this way until we figured we had all the charges neutralized. <laughs> British film showing transportation of landing craft to Allied armies prior to the Rhine crossing. At Ostend, Belgium, a landing ship dock unloads LCMs and LCVPs brought over from England. Both the Royal Navy and the U.S. overland fleet with hundreds of vessels aided in the amphibious crossing of the river. These Higgins boats, after being unloaded at Ostend, go around the coast to Antwerp and then move on to the front by way of the Albert Canal. The 
craft are sent to hiding places near the Rhine where they are stored to await the signal for the crossing. Although many vessels traveled the water route to their destination, most of the landing craft are sent to the front on specially fitted trucks called tank transporters. The trucks move down highways to Germany. D-Day across the Rhine saw a stream of LCMs and LCVPs ferrying men, tanks, guns, bulldozers and gasoline drums to the eastern bank, playing a vital role in the successful bridging of the river. Looking down on the beachhead established by 10th Army invasion forces on the southwest coast of Okinawa Island. In addition to the more than 1,500 Navy and Coast Guard warships which participated in the attack on the Japanese island, scores of cargo vessels are anchored offshore to supply our troops with needed materiel. Hundreds of small landing craft, alligators and ducks, fly back and forth between beach and ships carrying supplies. Hastily constructed causeways and newly built docks facilitate unloading operations. Troops, tanks and other equipment move inland over one of the island's main highways. Spearheads drive forward from the beachhead to cut the island in two. Marine units then push north while the 24th Army Corps strikes south toward the capital city of Naha, main center of Jap resistance. Repairing one of Okinawa's major airstrips pitted with bomb craters. Both the important Yantan and Kadena airfields were seized within a few hours after our landings. Much of Okinawa is intensively cultivated farming country. Infantry move up the road to destroy Jap emplacements. Main enemy opposition is centered in pillboxes and hillside caves. Natural hillside caves are fortified with machine guns or mortars. Troops must wipe out the pockets one by one. Many of these burrows conceal Okinawa civilians who fled to the hills to escape naval bombardment of the coast. Our troops try to persuade the civilians to give themselves up. More than 400,000 Japanese are on Okinawa, and their presence in such large numbers adds to the difficulties of the island campaign. AMG officers go in with the troops to establish military government. Reassured that the Americans will not torture or kill them, hundreds of Okinawans voluntarily give themselves up and offer to cooperate with army authorities. The children quickly respond to good treatment and soon learn to ask for candy. Destroyers shell Jap positions on Caballo, Philippine Islands, as troops of the 2nd Battalion, 51st Regiment, 38th Division, invade the tiny island just off the south coast of Corregidor. 155 millimeter howitzers based on nearby Bataan lay down a protective barrage of white phosphorus to screen landing operations. B-25s and P-51 strafe and bomb the island. The Caballo hillsides are thoroughly pounded. Preliminary
preliminary shelling clears the beach of enemy opposition and our troops encounter little Jap resistance as they spread out over the heavily mined beach. Elements of the 38th Division moving inland over rough hill country run into some sniper fire. Bazookas fire on Jap tunnel positions at hill number one. Destroying Japs entrenched in hillside caves. Our troops use grenades and demolition charges composed of 25 pounds of TNT in a bag with a 15 second fuse. Resulting explosions close all but the biggest caves, leaving the Japs inside to starve. Patrols attempt to rescue troops of E and F Company's 151st Regiment stranded without water, food, and ammunition on the top of a hillside. The rescue party tries to scale the 250-foot, 90-degree cliff with the aid of a guide rope, but crumbling rocks make it impossible for troops to climb the hillside. When the rope is secured to the top of the hill, supplies are hoisted to the stranded men. First attempts to pull the water cans are unsuccessful and additional men have to be placed on the hillsides to lend a hand at pulling. Attempts are first made to lower the wounded by basket litter, but they are unsuccessful. The wounded men are then forced to climb down alone and one at a time. Weak from their wounds and lack of water and food, the men drop exhausted on a shelf of the cliff and are helped down the rest of the way by medics. Several of the rescuing party are hurt when huge rocks are dislodged and roll down the hill. LCMs remove the wounded to LST hospital ships. Invasion of another Philippine island. Troops of the 3rd Battalion, 182nd Regiment, Americal Division, land at Talisai Point, Cebu. The attack follows a bombardment by cruisers and destroyers of the 7th Fleet. Opposition is moderate on the beach, although our troops are brought under small arms and mortar fire. Major General William H. Arnold, commander of the Americal Division, maps the drive on Cebu City, second largest in the Philippines. Mortars and other equipment are brought ashore. Troops quickly drive inland against disorganized enemy resistance. Elaborate tank traps and roadblocks are encountered along the highway leading from Talisai to Cebu City, five miles away. Landmines form part of the enemy's extensive coast defenses. These positions were abandoned by the enemy, whose garrison was weakened when troops were sent to fight at Leyte. Our losses in the invasion were described as extremely light. 4.2-inch mortars are brought forward by men of the 80th Mortar Battalion. Ninety minutes after hitting the beach, our tanks and troops had driven more than 800 yards inland. First organized enemy resistance is encountered on the outskirts of Pardo, a village two miles from Cebu City. With grenades and rifle fire, troops try to flush out Jap snipers hiding in a house. to set a fire to drive the enemy out into the open. Five of the six snipers in the house were killed, while one was wounded. Quickly wiping out the remaining Jap resistance in palm groves, rice paddies, and mangrove swamps, tanks and troops move on Pardo. Entering Pardo, our troops are greeted by Filipino civilians. 
machine guns and ammunition are hauled to the front in native carts called tatarmillas. During the first day's fighting, 88 Jap troops are killed and 16 taken prisoner. Our troops approach Cebu City. Retreating Japs filled the streets with mines and planted booby traps in homes and public buildings. Whole blocks were destroyed by demolition charges, but harbor facilities were undamaged. Fort San Pedro, an old military installation in the city. Capture of Cebu ends the Jap hold on all the central Philippines. Dust in the Irrawaddy Valley. Due to the constant rain of fine grit on the engines, British motorized units in Burma face serious mechanical difficulties. Not only do the dust clouds pose a threat to security of vehicular movement, but also roads are breaking down under heavy traffic. A solution to the problem is found through the use of elephant grass, which will be laid out to form a road matting. This constitutes one of the many improvisations applied by General Sir William Slim's 14th Army in its campaign through the difficult central Burma country. Terrain which suffers monsoon washouts and then excessive dryness poses challenging problems for road engineers. Bed of elephant grass minimizes the dust cloud, wards off ruts and other hindrances to safe and rapid passage of vehicles headed for the Burma front. OWI leaflets dropped in forward areas tell the Burmese about Allied air power and contain instructions for using the printed sheets as soap. Especially impregnated for this purpose, the leaflet works up a satisfactory lather when dipped into water. This incident in psychological warfare occurs in March at Mitsan, Burma, about 75 miles southwest of Nam Kham. Demonstrating assembly of the M100, only Japanese manufactured submachine gun. Captured by the British at Mactila, it's a 30-round air-cooled weapon weighing 10 pounds. This is probably the first appearance of the M100 in the Burma fighting. Previously, it had been reported in Manchuria and later was identified on Saipan. Replacing the stock, this gun is designed to take a bayonet. It fires 8-millimeter low-pressure ammunition. Fitted with a bipod for prone firing, the M100 may also be used as a shoulder weapon. The Japanese 75 millimeter field gun, 1930 model, first of its type to be captured. An unusual feature, which so far has not been found on any other Jap artillery weapon, is the muzzle brake. Elevation, 43 degrees. Traverse, 25 degrees. The 75 is characterized by a split trail. Ordnance sources state that the Japanese have surrounded this gun with a great deal of mystery since its introduction. Foreign military observers were unable to view it except at a distance during military reviews and maneuvers. A close-up study now reveals the complete firing mechanism. Muzzle velocity is 2,230 feet per second. Maximum range, 15,000 yards. Rate of fire, 10 to 12 rounds per minute. Nazi concentration camp at Holzen, Germany. It's one of seven found in this area by the 83rd Division, 9th Army during the drive to the Elba. Some of the prisoners photographed on 8th April are badly beaten, others diseased and emaciated. Of the 350 at the camp, 140 are Jews, 210 are Russians, Poles, and Czechs. 75% were imprisoned for alleged acts of sabotage. Lice and other vermin infest the camp. The Nazis confined the prisoners to a diet of potatoes. Stalag number 326 near Paderborn. Russian prisoners of war riot for food after liberation by elements of the 2nd Armored Division, 9th Army. 
Starved by the Nazis, they storm the food stores of the prison camp, and our troops are unable to restrain them. An apparently abundant stock of baking flour is one of the chief objectives of the hungry men. On 2nd April, a total of 10,000 Russians are freed at this main camp for enlisted men. In addition to starving these prisoners, it's reported that the Nazi guards committed repeated acts of physical violence. The Russians devour every edible they can lay their hands on. Once the men have eaten, the American troops have no trouble restoring order at the camp. These liberated Russians are told to remain in the camp and stay off the roads until a juncture with the Red Army makes repatriation possible. In Hadamar, Germany, a war crimes investigation team arrives at a Nazi institution seized by First Army troops. Under the guise of an insane asylum, this has been the headquarters for the systematic murder of 35,000 Poles, Russians, and Germans sent here mainly for political and religious reasons. First to appear before Majors Fulton Bowell and Hermann Bolker is Adolf Merkel, records clerk for the Hadamar Institution. He gives testimony confirming the murder of Poles and Russians. Next to appear are Dr. Wallmann, head of the institution, and Karl Willig, chief male nurse, who admits to killing inmates with overdoses of morphine. The testimony of other witnesses substantiates the fact that morphine was issued at the institution without attempt at making a record. As many as 17 at a time died from the morphine injections. The investigating officers are told that the Nazis never bothered to determine whether a victim may have survived the overdosage. Instead, all were hustled off to the graveyard and buried in piles of 20 to 24. The prisoners are removed to await trial. Meanwhile, at the graveyard attached to the institution, bodies are exhumed for autopsy. 20,000 are buried here. 15,000 who died in a lethal gas chamber were cremated and their ashes interred. Men of the WCIT arrive to examine the corpses. Major Bolter performs the autopsy. A detailed listing is made of all clinical data. A Hadamar judge told the investigators that when the 10,000th victim died, the institution heads and Nazi officials staged a celebration. Political prisoners shot by Nazi troops before the arrival of General Patton's 4th Armored Division in the Gotha area. At this concentration camp near Ordruf, Germany, the Germans starved, clubbed, and burned to death more than 4,000 political prisoners over a period of eight months. A few captives survived by hiding in the woods. They state that the last batch of victims, numbering 150, were executed less than 24 hours prior to the entry of 4th Armored Elements under Colonel Hayden Sears. On 7th April, Army trucks arrive with a group of German civilians from the Ordruf area. They are to be taken on a tour of the campsite by Colonel Sears. A German officer wearing the Red Cross armband also is invited to view the atrocities. First, they see the bodies of those murdered by the Nazis because they were too ill to accompany them in their retreat. Next to the shed where the dead are stacked in layers and the stench is overpowering. All are told they must enter. These two are identified as slave labor bosses who maltreated, tortured, and killed their workers. The taller man protests that he's innocent and that this is a propaganda demonstration arranged by the Americans.
The others leave the shed. Now to the crude crematory where 4,500 prisoners are believed to have been disposed of. Ashes, arms and legs and charred bodies remain as evidence. The story of the atrocities is read for the visitors. The victims are said to include Poles, Czechs, Russians, Belgians, Frenchmen, German Jews and German political prisoners. General Eisenhower suggested that a group of congressmen and editors be sent to Germany to make a first-hand report on the concentration camps overrun by Allied armies. <laughs> 